Welcome to week four. We are going to be discussing Persians and the Greeks this week. We're going to start with the Persians. Both of these empires you've probably heard a little bit about, hopefully. If not, um, you're going to learn plenty about them this week. And let's get started. Now, the Persian empires are, were the central part of them, was located in modern day country of Iran today. There, you'll see that there are four major. Uh, dynasties within this empire and let's get started. So the first of these dynasties is the Achaemenide Empire. Now please keep in mind I am horrific at pronouncing these so don't make fun of me too bad. Anyway, so the Persians actually migrated from Central Asia uh, before 1000 BCE and we're going to see that they're going to move in towards the Mediterranean area. We're going to start seeing their movement around um, Middle East and going back into Asia. Now the Persians moved into this area because of the weakening of Syrian and Babylonian empires. So as those two empires are declining, we're going to see the Persians are coming up into uh, coming up and rising in power. Now the original leader was Cyrus, Cyrus the shepherd. He is the he's called the shepherd and referred to as the shepherd because he was able to move and motivate so many people to really expand their borders and do all this. It's going the empire is going to peak under. Darius who ruled the Indus to Aegean Sea and he's going to build a monstrous capital city which shows the reign and the power. Now some of the uh, most important contributions of this dynasty of the Persians is their administrative uh, possibilities that they achieved. They had 23 administrative divisions. Government was so important to them and having a strong government and a connected government. Um, staff was principally lo uh, principally local, which means we're going to have people who know people, know the people in the area and what the locals need. So very understanding. You're also going to see a system of spies and surprise audits to ensure sure that the locals are not rebelling against this new Persian empire. We're going to see that these are going to be copied and used again and again in all our future empires. They're also the first ones to have standardized currency for taxation. Beforehand, you would pay in grains and you would do all this. We This is the first time we're really going to have currency. And you're also going to see massive road building. Uh, ro road building connecting the entire empire as well as courier services or mail, mail services. Now, for the technology, they are going to bring to the world underground uh, underground canals. This is going to avoid excessive loss to evaporation because of the fresh water. Um, extensive road building, the Persian Royal Road is going to be 1,600 miles. Uh, some of it's going to be paved. You're, it allows their military to move fast and allows the courier service to be so successful. Eventually, the Achaemen Empire is going to decline because of the re, uh, rebuilding of Temple in Jerusalem. This empire was very tolerant. However, uh, we're going to see that later on, rulers are not so tolerant, people are going to rebel. Xerxes is a harshly represses rebellions in Mesopotamia and in Egypt because of his severe... Uh, his severe backlash in these two areas, those people just completely all out rebel and it creates an increase of public discontent. So now the Persian Wars are going to be probably what you guys know the most of. If you've ever seen Sparta, you know, heard of Sparta and that movie, that's what we're talking about here, the Persian Wars. We're going to have the Persians are going to try to fight the Greeks. Okay, now the Greeks landmass is a peninsular. However, it does have islands around it. So the Persians start a fight with the island Greeks and then eventually the rest of the Greeks start joining in. Uh, Persians are going to be defeated in Marathon, which is you know, a huge story of why we honor and run marathons today. We'll talk about that in class. And Alexander the Great conquers the Achaemenid empires. So Alexander the Great is going to come in and take over it all. Now, what's going to happen after Alexander the Great comes in? He's going to die. Very suddenly he gets sick and he dies. Now, the Suclid Empire is the next empire that we're going to study and the next dynasty of the Persians. Now, between 
Alexander Great's generals, what we see is that the generals are then going to divide the empire, and the best part goes to Seuclus. Now, it's, it is eventually, as soon as it's, of course, as soon as Alexander the Great dies, all of the people around the world are going to start rebelling who are part of this Persian. Attacks by rebellion in India, invasion of the Parthians. Now, here's a map of their empire. You can see it's very, very extensive. You can see how powerful it really was. Now, the Parthenian Empire is a semi-nomadic Parthians drive Seuclus out of Iran. Okay, It's a federated governmental structure, especially strong cavalry, which means they have horses and they're well-ridden, which means they're strong warriors on there. Uh, weakened by ongoing wars with Romans, it fell to internal rebellion. So we're going to see that this Parthenian Seuclus are going to fall pretty quickly. Now, the Sanseed Empire is going to come up next. Now, it claimed descent from the Achmans, which is the first of the Persians. It has continual conflicts with Rome, Byzantium in the west, and the Kush in the east. So it is constantly under attack the whole time. It is overwhelmed by Arab conquests in 651, and the Persian administration and culture observed into local Islamic culture. So a lot of the... Um, I, things we identify as Arab-esque are actually Persian in nature, which is actually more of an Asian. Now, the Parthenon and the Sanad empires, you're going to see that it is a much smaller landmass. You're going to have, see it's not as closely tied to the Mediterranean Sea. That is mostly because of the Romans. As we know, the Romans are going to come over and take over a lot of landmass as well. Now, Persian society is actually really kind of very, very interesting, kind of unique. Now, it has early steppe traditions because it is from the Central Asia uh, region. They're warriors, they have priests, they have peasants, and family clan and kinship are very important. So we're going to see very tight, small packed uh, families. However, we're going to start uh, in creating a bureaucrat class with this new empire. So all of a sudden, we're going to have tax collectors, record keepers, translators and these are positions of power and these are uh, positions of great influence. Now, we're also going to see we're going to have slave classes, prisoners of wars, conquered populations are going to be what this population is made up of, uh, debtors also, children, uh, spouses also sold in sl uh, slavery, principally domestic uh, servitude. Okay, some agricultural laborers and some public works, but mostly it's going to be domestic. Keep in mind, at this point, we don't have a lot of the um, tools we do now to make our lives simpler. Everything is very complex. Now, the uh, Persian economy is several areas exceptionally fertile, and some areas not so exceptionally fertile. Long-distance trade benefits from Persian road building is going to be one of the strongest things. This is going to be the foundation of the Silk Road, which we're going to study here in a couple weeks. And goods from India are especially valued. All the spices and stuff give uh, the Persian Empire such great wealth. Now... Zoroastrianism is an early Aryan influence on Persian religious traditions. Now, we know of these Aryans. We know how much of an impact they have on the Indian uh, subcontinent, as we know, because of the social caste. They're also going to have a huge impact here on the Persians as well. Now, they're going to worship some of the gods, okay? And they're going to follow some of the oral teachings as well. And they're going to kind of build up this into their culture. Now, under Alexander, massacre of Magi and burning of Zoran temples is going to create a huge problem. However, uh, which is part of the reason why so many Indians rebel and eventually overthrow the empire, their little dynasty. However, it's going to weaken Parthenon support eventually and major reveal under Sand's persecution of non-Zorans. So we're going to see that under Alexander and his empire, we're going to see that it's absolutely not wanted. Under this new empire, we're going to see that it's appreciated. Eventually will be discriminated under Islam as well. So other religious groups in the Persians, major Mesopotamian, uh, major Mesopotamian communities of Jews. Remember, the uh, Hebrews got kicked out of all their homelands, so we're going to see they're all over the place, and they make up a huge population. Composition of the Talmud, okay, constitution of Judaism, so we're going to see a lot of powerful people. Um, Jews are going to be... Uh, 
able to move up in society, which is uh, hasn't really happened before. And Buddhism, Christianity, and Machism also survived. So we're going to see that because of the Persians are so understanding to most of the degree, we're going to have a lot of these big uh, religions, especially Buddhism, Christianity, uh, thrive under the Persians. But we are going to see that we have a lot of smaller religions as well, and it's due to their cultural uh, understanding of freedom of religion to a degree. All right, that's your Persians. Four major dynasties. They're all going to crumble pretty quickly. The first one is going to be the greatest. Let's talk about the Greeks. Now, classical Greece is going to go from 800 to 350 BCE. As you can see from the map here, this is all Greek except for Anatolia, obviously. Everywhere you can see we have so many small little islands, and these islands are going to come up with their own unique cultures. But we're going to see one big cultural identification of the Greeks. Now, the early development of the Greek society, the Minoan society, uh, started on the island of Crete. Major city is Knossos. Okay, it, they became the center of maritime trade on the Mediterranean Sea. Now, we have written documents from them, but we're unable to decipher it. It's too complicated, and we don't have any key of how to get into it. Now, the Minoan society is going to, which is on Crete, is going to eventually go into a great decline because of natural disasters, earthquake, volcanic eruptions, tidal waves. All of these things are going to cause major problems for the civilization. Foreign invasions are going to come, and Crete falls under foreign dominion pretty quickly. Now, the next major generation is the Mycenaean. Now, these are Indo-European invaders descended through the Balkans into the Greek peninsula. They're influenced by the Minoan culture, okay, but how they're not the same people. We're going to see that these are different people, and we're going to see that they are great military leaders, so they're going to be protecting and fortifying themselves. Now, the chaos in the eastern Mediterranean during this time. Now, we're going to see how the Trojan War, we're going to have the Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey is going to be written around this time. The Mycenaeans are the ones who write that. Political turmoil is going to cause a lot of problem, and eventually the Mycenaean civilization completely disappears. So we have the, no Mino uh, the Minoans who are on Crete. They thrive, they do really well, and they decline, and then we're going to have the Mycenaeans. They're going to come in. They're going to thrive for a little bit. Obviously, we've all heard about the Trojan War, and then they're going to fall as well. Now, the next great Greek civilization is the Polis. It's a city-state. It's an urban center uh, uh, dominating surrounding rural areas. It's highly independent, which makes it allow, which makes it easier to protect. Um, it has monarchies. Okay, they have tyrant. Uh, they have tyrants. However, they're not too submit oppressive and early democracies. So remember, the Greeks invented democracy. So the polis are going to be uh, very, very powerful. Now, in these little small little city states, we're going to have another one called Sparta which we all have heard of. Highly militarized society, subjugated people are called the Helots. Uh, they have serfs tied to the land. They outnumber the Spartans 10 to 1 by the 6th century BCE. Now the Spartans are going to be, uh, the serfs are going to outnumber the Spartans, which is going to cause a major problem later on in their history. Their military society developed to control the threat of rebellion. And we're going to see they're very highly effective in these city-states. So it's their small little group a small, intense civilization that all together are part of the Greeks. Now, Spartan society, the austerity of the norm, okay, we are going to see that they are trying to force and mold people into the type of um, citizens they want and they, they uh, respect. So boys are removed from the families by age seven. They receive military training and barracks. Active military ser uh, service follows. Marriage, uh, you get married early on, however, you are not going to have a home life until the age of 30 because you'll be moving around with the military. Um, some relaxation of discipline by the 4th century CE, so we are going to see things will change um, throughout. However, we're going to see that it becomes highly effective, coming, uh, highly effective for preparing these for war. Now Athens is another city-state. It is the development of early 
of democracy. Free adult males only are going to vote. Women and slaves are not included. Yet, contrast Athenian style of government with Spartan militarism, you're going to see that there's a huge difference between these two Greek civilizations, and we're going to see that they are going to fight each other many, many times throughout, but they're eventually going to lean on each other in order to, you know, beat out external forces. Now, Athenian society is based on maritime trade, which brings increasing prosperity beginning the 7th century. It becomes the most powerful city-state. Uh, only could be argued that the Spartans are, are, are the most powerful, but most people would agree Athens is the most powerful than the Spartans. Aristocrats dominate smaller landholders, increasing socioeconomic tensions. Ca class conflict is a huge problem because the uh, Greeks, ha especially in Athens, have such a uh, economic gap between the two realms. The wealthy are really wealthy and the poor are very poor. No, Solon and Athenian democracy. Aristocrat Solon mediates crises. Uh, Aristocrats keep large hand, but forgive debts, ban debt slavery. So we're going to see that we're going to try to close those economic gaps, remove family restrictions against participating in public life. Um, all of a sudden, now women are having a little bit more opportunity to be a part of it. Instituted paid civil service. Um, that is the biggest thing. And people wanted to volunteer, but they couldn't afford to do it. So the Greeks are now going to pay people to be uh, civil servants, uh, like judges and uh, senators and all those types of government services. So we're going to pay them now. Now Pericles, he ruled the Greek. Uh, he is the Athens ruler. He's the high point of Athenian democracy. Aristocratic but popular. Massive public works encourage cultural development. So we're gonna see he is the greatest of the Athenian uh, leaders. Okay, we're gonna also start. The uh, Athenians are also going to start colonizing. The population expansion drives colonization. They're gonna go after the coastal Mediterranean and Black Sea region. They're gonna get Sicily. Um, they're gonna go after southern France, Anatolia, and southern Ukraine. So they're gonna be all over the place putting up these little colonies. It's not straight up conquest. They're not sending their militaries there. They're just starting little cities. Now, the classical Greece is, uh, this is a great picture. All of those red locations on the map are going to be your Greek colonies. So you can see they're not conquering like the Persians are. They're setting up these colonies where they are getting the goods, sending them back, and essentially increasing the wealth. Now, the effects of Greek colonization is going to be trade throughout the region. The Greeks are the first ones to really kind of dominate the Mediterranean Sea and have such a power of trade there. Communication of ideas, language, and culture are going to be spread very quickly and very effectively, and political and social effects. We're going to see that um, the Greek democracy isn't going to catch on really anywhere else until the Romans adopt it, but they, the ideas of a democracy do start spreading. We're going to see that it does have effect on other uh, governments. Now, the per, uh, Persian Wars. Now, the Greeks revolt against the Persian, em, uh, Persian Empire in 500 BCE. Okay, Athens supports with ships, uh, yet the Greek rebellion crushed by Darius. Athenians rout Persian army in 490. Okay, successor Euxenes burns Athens, but driven out as well. So it's a back and forth, um, uh, back and forth conflict that lasts for quite some time. Now, the Delian League, the Polyus create Delian League to forestall more Persian attacks, okay? It's essentially, um, it's essentially they're paying the Athenians money and essentially for the, in return for a promise that they are going to keep the Persians out. It's massive payments to Athens, fuels, Pyroclean expansion, uh, resented by other Polyus. And you're going to see that Athens is going to benefit from this. All the other and um, all the other Greek city states are going to kind of suffer behind it because the cost is so expensive. But the Athenians are like, if the Persians come back, we're not going to defend you. You have to help us. So it, there's a good there's a trade of balance here. Now, the Philippinesian War is a civil war in Greece because these other polis are so struck, are so annoyed with Athens and these paying of all this money in order to earn protection, they end up rebelling. So they end up rebelling in, against Athens led by Sparta. So you either side with Athens or you side with Sparta. You can't have it both ways. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Eventually, Athens is forced to surrender, uh, but conflict continued between Sparta and other polis for quite some time. Now, one of the other great um, kingdoms is going to be the kingdom of Macedon. Uh, it's a frontier region north of the Greek peninsula. King Philip II builds massive military, and eventually you're going to see it starting to encroach on um, Greek polis to the south. And we're going to start having a little bit of conflict there. So Macedon is going to be a location where um, great military is going to come from. And eventually we're going to meet Alexander the Great, who is the son of Philip II. Now, Alexander of Macedon is, had a huge military upbringing. His father was a military, genius, a military uh, man himself, and he taught his son from a very early age. And as we know, Alexander conquered most of the known world, essentially, by the time his 37th birthday. Anyway, so Alexander the Great, he re led rapid expansion throughout Mediterranean uh, Basin, invasion of Persian successfully, which was not been done in their own territory, and turned back in India when exhausted troops mutinied. So he's going to reach all the way from Greek peninsula all the way to India. Uh, huge empire. However, as soon as they get to India, his troops are going to say, you know what, we're done here. And the troops start mutinying, which uh, Alexander understands, and then he starts his way back. Now, here's his empire. You can see that he is going to take um, most, he is going to capture most of the Greek peninsula. He is going to go into Egypt and conquer there, as well as spread all the way over into India, Asia. Now the Hellenistic empires, after Alexander's death, competition for the empire increased significantly. Alexander died when he was like 41, 42, very early death. He got sick and died uh, very quickly. Uh, eventually, after his death, it's divided by his generals. Greece and Macedon stay together. Egypt is going to be controlled by the Ptolemy, and the Siculus is the Persian Achaemenid Empire. So we're going to see that it's divided three different ways. Now, the economic integration, intellectual costs, fertilization is going to be the greatest thing that comes out of Alexander the Great. He is bringing all of this information, uh, setting up brand new types of government in a way that hasn't been done yet to this extent. Now, the Antigone Empire is the smallest of the Hellenistic empires. It had local descent and it had issue of land distribution. Heavy colonizing, though, so they do have a lasting, uh, a lasting impact. Now, the Polytomatic Empire is the wealthiest of all of them. Second to, of course, Athens, but they establish um, state monopolies, textile, salt, and beer. They're the ones going to be mass producing this and trading for trading with it with the rest of the empire. Their capital is Alexandria. Okay, as we know, with Alexander the Great, he names pretty much every city he creates after him, and Alexandria is the capital of this. It is located in Egypt. It's a very important port city. We're going to see that it's going to have an impact during the uh, Egyptian culture as well, because the ancient Egyptians are, are still functioning and doing their thing down there. Alexander is going to build a major museum and a library there, and we're going to see that it becomes a very, very powerful place. Now, the Seclude Empire is a massive colonization of the Greeks. Um, it exports Greek culture, values as far east as India. You're going to see that it is going to have the greatest influence um, because of the fact of the trade. Now, the trade integration in the Mediterranean Basin is done because of the Greeks, and we're going to see the Romans do it again later on. Greece had very little grain, but rich in olives and grapes. So we're going to see the colonies are going to be such a huge component of this because they don't have any means to make bread and wheat and all that. Commerce rather than agriculture as basis of much of its economy. So we're going to see that growing food is not the priority of this empire, which is very unique compared to all the other empires. It's actually the interaction of trade and commerce. So one unique thing there about the Greeks. Now, the Pananelic festivals, um, because the Greek Empire was so expansive and so spread out and so powerful, um, they used to do Pananelic festivals, which would gather large, uh, most people of the empire, and especially from all the regions together, eventually turns into the Olympic Games, and a sense of collective identity of being Greek 
And that becomes a huge, huge selling point because of the Greek and being proud of the Greeks and being able to identify Greek. Now, the, the, all of these Greek civilizations are going to be patriarchal. Women are seen as goddesses, wives, or prostitutes. So you got the whole spectrum there for women. Limited exposure in public sphere. You're not supposed to go out. I mean, you're able to go shopping. You're able to go out and that. But you're not supposed to socialize out in public. Uh, Sparta had a partial exception. Women were seen as a little more equal and seen as warriors on their own right. So you're going to see Sparta is the only place where women are treated slightly more fair. However, still not a great time to be a woman. Um, they were also going to have the role of emphasizing Greek culture and society we're going to see that um, birth is not as highly praised and appreciated in Greek culture as it has been in all the others we're going to see that slavery is a huge thing they're taking slaves from Ukraine from Africa um, sometimes used in business however slaves do have the opportunity to buy their freedom um, so that is something that's very unique of the Greeks. Now, the Greek language is going to be an incredible uh, benefit and such a powerful force for them. First and foremost, they're going to steal the, Persian, uh, the Phoenician alphabet. They're going to add some vowels, and it makes it a complex language that um, is used much more uh, thoroughly throughout the empire than any other language before. We're going to see that a lot of people are reading and writing. We're going to still have a lot of oral histories, but we're still going to have a lot more reading and writing. Remember, the Greeks were the ones who inv who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, so keep that in mind. Science and math um, used of observational evidence, rational thought. Um, we're going to see a lot of um, science be done on atoms, systematic approach to mathematics. Um, Hippocrates is going to be human anatomy and physiology. All right, uh, we're going to have a lot of great people, including Socrates, the Socratic method of, of talking more so than lecturing. He had a student named Plato, public godfi, condemned on charges of immorality, forced to drink hemlock. That's how he died, um, which is kind of interesting. But Socrates wrote a couple of uh, books of arguments, and you'll have to read them in college. Plato, systema a systemized Socratic thought. He wrote The Republic, which is about the philosophy of kings and theory of forms or ideas and how to formulate ideas and all that. Aristotle is another very famous Greek. He is a student of Plato, uh, Plato broke the theory of forms or ideas. Emphasis on empirical findings. He believed reason is the key for everything. And a massive impact on Western thought, we're going to see that he is going to be one of the ones that have the most lasting impact. Now, Greek theology, it's going to be polytheism. Zeus is the principal god. They're going to have religious cults as well. Uh, rituals eventually are going to be a little bit more domesticated. We do know that the Romans are going to take the Greek uh, polytheistic religion and then make it their own. Now, tragic... Drama, evolutions from public presentations of cultic rituals, major playwrights, uh, comedies. We're going to see all of these are really going to come out of Greece. And finally, the Hellenistic philosophies, the Epicureans, our pleasure, okay, skeptics, doubt possibilities, and Stoics, duty, virtue, emphasis on inner peace. So those are the three major theories. Well, that's it for the Greeks and the Persians. Um, as you can see, the Greeks are more heavily researched and more uh, more information based. So please keep in mind to keep your dynasty straight. And I look forward to seeing you guys in class this week. Yay! Have a great day!